worship our King. Let us worship. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Great things. See what our Savior has done. You overcome. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. We worship you.
miracles when you move. Such an easy thing for you to do. Your head is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able. And my God, come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Because you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. I know, I know, you never win. You can do it all. Everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. A new wind is blowing right now. Breaking my heart of stone, taking over like it's Jericho. And my walls are all crashing down. And right now, I know you're able. And my God, come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things. No, you never lost a battle. I know, I know, you never will. You can do all things, all things. You can do all things, but fair. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. I know, I know, you never will. Lost a battle, never lost a battle, never lost a battle, you never win, you never lost a battle, 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 you never win, you never lost a battle, always God, 
long for more of you.
start before the beginning of time with no point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life and as you speak In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars remain to worship, so alive. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star is signal fire of grace. Creation sings your praise, your soul alive. So alive. God of your promise, we don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. You have spoken on nature and science. Follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, growing in pursuit of what you say. If it all reveals your nature so alive, I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you so alive, so If the rock 
hearts cry out in silence, so alive. If the sum of all our praise is to fall shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion.
Blessed be your name, God. Jesus, Lord most high. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name. Lord, it's our delight to worship you this morning. It's our delight to be in your presence. Lord, we find healing and hope, purpose, God, clarity in the midst of confusion when we're in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, New Life Vineyard. What a blessed day. Isn't our prayer team, our worship team awesome? Give, give them a hand. Outstanding, outstanding. Bring in the presence of the Lord. 
Hey, there's several announcements this morning. For those of you, you should have our, our trusty um, greeters handed out some bulletins, but if you miss some, raise your hand. We have the ushers here that can give you a bulletin. There's a lot of information on here. I want you to put some things on your calendar. Uh, nights of prayer every Tuesday, we get together and pray, corporate prayer. Uh, please don't miss that if you're available at 7 p.m. Uh, where the saints come together to praise and worship corporately. Where two and three gather together, God is in our presence. Amen? A scriptural. Okay. Movie night is coming up June 11th at 7 p.m. Watch a documentary series investigating evidence for biblical accounts in the light of our current understanding of history. So you can learn about the Bible, you can learn about history um, with these series that we're going to do on movie night. So put that on your calendar, Friday, June 11th, 7, 7 p.m. Starting back up, July 4th parade. Yes! We're having some gatherings outside of this COVID-19 epidemic. So that begins again. Worship team will have a float. i love for you to come out and support them, pray with them, meet and greet those that are that come out to see the parade. So more information will come on that as we get closer, but that will be Sunday, July 4th. A Wednesday night Zoom Bible study, 7.30 p.m. Those continue. Don't miss those. They're great. Hey, I'm going to give a little shout out. I'm, I'm teaching this. I'm, I'm teaching this Wednesday. Be there. Be there. Be square. Right, Nathaniel? Okay, so come on out. Uh, we love to interact. It's a good interaction. We, we talk and, and dig into scripture, ask questions, uh, see scripture from a different way of what God is saying. We're dealing with the hard sayings of Jesus. What are some of the things that Jesus has said that may have several different meanings that we may not even understand it? Um, new group, The Chosen, is available now. Tuesdays at 11 a.m., Rick and Gwen Hanger is going to be there uh, to lead us in the Chosen TV series, series um, what it might have been like to be one of Jesus' first followers. Who would have liked to do that? I would have. It would have been tough. Right? It would have been tough. Okay. And... We also have our offerings. So get your offerings prepared. You can offer, um, give your offerings in the back bucket, text it, go to New Life Vineyard as well. And let's pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you do and all that you are to us. We thank you that you are a God that loves us unconditionally, Lord, and that you will bless the cheerful giver. We don't give out of obligation to you, but we give because we love you and want to see your fruit and your blessing in this ministry, in your kingdom, in this state, in this nation. So, Lord, then we thank you for that. Bless our going out and our coming in and help us to be ministers of your gospel this week and all we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, today we remember those men and women who have died in service to our country. We pause to reflect on the lives sacrificed while protecting our freedoms. We confess that most days we are oblivious to the price paid by men and women in uniform, and yet we live every day in the freedom they laid down their lives to give us. So today, we recall the words of Jesus when he said, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And let us not forget that each life lost represents other lives that are left to pick up the pieces. We lift up widows and widowers, brothers and sisters, parents and children of the service men and women who fought valiantly for our country. We ask for your peace and comfort to never leave them. God, we thank you for the lives of these men and women. May their memory and their service never be forgotten. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Uh, I've heard it said that uh, when you're over there, maybe you aren't thinking as grand thoughts of all of us here. Uh, you're thinking about the person to the right and the left of you, and that's kind of the biggest thing on your mind. And uh, even with that, uh, I'm so grateful to have known some of these people. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm so, my best friend's little brother is one that passed, uh, giving his life uh, in service. And uh, so it's meaningful for me. So, uh, God, I just, I thank you today. I thank you for the opportunity to know wonderful people that have followed your lead in the definition of greatest love. And uh, thank you for coming and, and modeling that for us. And thank you for uh, the blessing of, of these people that have done that for us. And, and I pray for the families uh, that are spending this weekend in special remembrance and reflection in and around, you know, picnics or games or trips to the beach. Uh, I thank you, Father, for, uh, for them. And I ask that you would be with them and bring comfort and bring peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think he's, he's working on that little ring there. So we'll get there. We've been looking in the last couple of weeks at the lives of a couple of pretty amazing prophets in the Bible, okay? We've started with Elijah. He made very bold statements for God in a time when his culture was very not supportive. In fact, there were people in power doing their best to kill him because he was making a stand for God, for his law, his values. And we've also seen that while Elijah knew how to follow God's direction and be bold in dangerous moments, he was really pretty insecure on the inside, wasn't he? We, we kind of saw that last week particularly. You know, many times he was uncertain and even afraid. You know, the, the threats coming from his world got to him. I think we can identify with that, right? Maybe we aren't experiencing exactly what Elijah did, but we can identify with things getting to us, the, the situations around us, the threats. Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets of the time before Jesus, but he feels, I think, like many of us feel, and he talks like many of us talk. He dealt with depression. He dealt with a certain amount of anxiety and burnout. He felt like he was the only one doing what God wanted, right? He wasn't, actually, but he felt that way. And it was hard at times to continue serving God and keep going another day when he felt like he wasn't seeing fruit. He wasn't getting any credit for it. The productivity didn't seem there. Nobody was thanking him. And we see through the last couple of weeks that Elijah really, he's kind of just a normal guy doing what God asked him to do. He wouldn't have gone out to the mountain and had the showdown if God hadn't prompted him to do it. He's just a normal guy living his life until God asked him to do something. And I think that's why his faith makes such a great example to us today. He's just a normal person doing what God asked him to do. Today, we get to meet Elisha. Elisha. It's an S-H instead of a J. Elisha. And I love reading about Elisha, too, because he's also a pretty normal guy doing whatever God asked him to do. He was not the son of a priest or a king. He wasn't a great warrior like Samson or Gideon or maybe David. He wasn't this great leader, didn't hold political office, didn't live in Jerusalem with the kings. The first time we see Elisha, he is not this spiritual giant. He's an ordinary guy living at home with his parents, working on a farm. And then God asked him to do something. So let's look at, at 1 Kings 19. Last week, we left off with God bringing Elijah out of his depression, right? It's the first part of this chapter. Elijah rested and he ate. He went off to seek time alone with God on a mountain. Then God sends Elijah back to anoint a couple people, to continue ministering, continue serving, pursuing God's purpose. And that's where Elijah's at. He's feeling a lot better now. And we're joining him as he's leaving God's mountain in this time of restoration in God's presence. In verse 19, it says, Elijah left there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, as he was plowing. Twelve teams of oxen were in front of him, and he was on the twelfth team in the back. And Elijah walked up by him and threw his mantle over him, his cloak over him. So Elisha left the oxen, ran to follow Elijah, and said, okay, please let me kiss my mother and my father, and, and then I'll follow you. And Elijah says, well, go on back then. I mean, what have I done to you? 
So Elisha turned back from following Elijah for a moment, took the team of oxen, and this is kind of crazy, he slaughtered them, and with the oxen's wooden yoke and plow, he cooked the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he left, followed Elijah, and served him. So there's a couple things we see about Elisha here. He's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He himself was driving the 12th pair. So he's probably doing the same job he's been doing for a long time, I would guess. He's working on the family farm, plowing with oxen. You're plodding along behind him in the hot sun, middle of the day. What do you smell? Nothing good. Not at all, right? But this is normal life for him. His, his family had some money or they wouldn't have been able to put on this size of an operation. But they didn't have enough to keep their baby boy out of the fields, okay? So day in and day out, he's got this wonderful scenery for hours and hours and hours every day. In case you're having trouble picturing it, I, I grabbed a picture uh, to help you really uh, get a sense of, of Elisha's view as he worked every day. Those oxen look like they need a little bit of help, actually. Now... Many of you may not actually be looking at the hind ends of oxen every day, but maybe you do think you're feeling a similar pain at least, right? Whatever it is you've got going in life, it's monotonous maybe. It, it never stops. There's always more that needs doing. None of it is really all that glamorous. You're going to the same job. You're working with the same people, and you're thinking, I do kind of feel like I'm staring at the rear ends of oxen. Now, Please don't go in and call your co-workers oxen rears. It will not actually help the way you feel. I tried that with Ken this week, and he almost didn't let me preach today. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Definitely kidding. I did not say that. But some of you, you're, maybe you're in sales, and day in and day out, you work to make your quota, and the next month, it starts all over again. You're thinking, this is so monotonous. All I do is try to meet a standard again and again and again. Some of you might be students and you're thinking, I study and I work to pay bills. And I study some more and I work to pay more bills. And I study and, I, and it's oxen rears everywhere. <laughs> if you're a parent, what do you see all day long? Diapers, laundry, dishes, diapers, laundry, dishes, diapers, laundry, dishes, diapers, laundry, dishes. And it's, it's easy to lose your passion for life when all you see is oxen rears all day long. And Elisha was there, okay? He's an ordinary guy with ordinary routines. He's getting dirty in the fields, oxen all over the place. And I wonder if, if he ever asked, does God have a, a bigger plan for me? A bigger purpose in my life? Am I stuck here staring at oxen rears for the end of my days? And I'm thinking maybe he did ask that question at some point. And I think that because every teenager who's ever lived and grown up in their parents' home has thought exactly that. Is there ever more for me? God, are you ever going to come get me out of this monotony? I don't want to mow the lawn again. You know, whatever it might be. But here's the thing to notice about Elisha. Even though he may have questioned, we see him being faithful to the task at hand. He's there. It was a mundane job, but he's doing the job. He's still showing up for work day after day, being faithful to do what was in front of him. Because until God comes and asks you to do something different, living up to that responsibility is the thing God's asking you to do. Amen. Some food for thought there. I believe God loves to reward those who are faithful in the little things, the mundane routines, the everyday responsibilities, the 5 a.m. again, the chores that take discipline to keep doing over and over and over. That's a calling that God has on our lives in certain seasons, and he blesses us for it. And when you prove you can be faithful with that little, he knows, and I think more importantly, we learn that he can trust us with more. So in the middle of Elisha's daily routine, on a normal day, not expecting anything new, it's oxen again, God decides to send something new. Verse 19 says, Elijah walked by him and threw his mantle over him. Now the mantle or the cloak in this culture was often symbolic of covering or anointing. Okay, Elijah's cloak would basically have been an open coat of some kind, probably made of animal skins. It in itself wasn't all that special. It's just his covering. So when Elijah came by and he threw that over Elisha, he's symbolically saying, that which covered me will now cover you. 
That which was the mantle on my life will now be the mantle on your life. The anointing from God, which I have been under, you will now be under. You'll be my student. I will be your mentor. As God has been working through me, now God is going to work through you. And as we watch how this ordinary guy, Elisha, he picks up on this and he responds to this out of the blue call. As we watch this, we're going to see two principles of ridiculous commitment. Now, here's the important thing. God will not ask us to do exactly what he asked Elisha to do, okay? And he probably won't ask it in the same way. Uh, crazy guy's not going to walk down the street, throw his coat over you. And if he does, you probably don't need to follow him, okay? Uh, I'm, I am not going to throw my coat over you, most likely. You, you would not know what it meant unless you were here in this message. But no matter our backgrounds, no matter our head starts or our handicaps, we can know that we... Ordinary women and men here today, we have the ability to respond with the same two principles when God asks us to do our something. Whether we're rich or we're poor, we're old or young, Elisha models something that is possible for all of us. The first thing is this, you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. It's scary, but you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. When Elijah comes to Elisha, throws his cloak over his shoulders, Elijah doesn't provide any details, does he? Elisha doesn't know why this is happening, where it's coming from, when things are going to start, how long it's going to last. The only thing he knows is Elijah wants him to follow and become a student of sorts. I think he was able to figure that out. And I think God's looking for ordinary people today who will do the same kind of thing. When God puts an ask in front of you to do something, you don't have to understand all of the details to obey immediately. So what does Elisha do when Elijah puts his mantle over him? Elisha leaves his oxen, runs after Elijah real quick to grab him, say, hey, let me kiss my mom and dad goodbye, then I'm right with you. Now notice this, he didn't have to pray about it. Did a pastor just actually say that? I'll explain in a second. He didn't have to think about it for months. He didn't have to make his tea chart, you know, with the pros and the cons. And, and, and he didn't have to go consult a counselor or ask his friends, you know, what should I do? No. He recognizes, God, I believe you're speaking to me here. So even though I don't know the details, since I believe you're behind it, I will obey immediately. I'm, I'm, I'm going. And that's our key, okay? Recognize God's voice when he speaks. This is, this is like the most important part of this whole message, so key in with me here. This is what shows me that Elisha was already a person of faith in his ordinary life. You remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Elijah and the showdown on the mountain with, with Ahab. Elijah told Ahab, call all of Israel out to see this. So all of Israel, at least people from all over Israel came out. And they saw God consume the sacrifice off the altar with fire from heaven. So either Elisha was there, probably just maybe a week before, and he saw that, or he'd for sure heard about it by now. So he knew things were going on. He knew God was at work. He knew there were things moving. And I believe he had a functional faith in God because now when he encounters this man fresh from the presence of God, like Elijah coming back from the mountain of God, Elisha's first instinct is to run forward instead of backward. So if pursuing God is part of your normal routine, you will recognize God's voice when he speaks. You will. If you make a practice of prayer, studying the Bible, worshiping on a daily basis, it's a habit for you, you will know his presence when it shows up in the unexpected times. Now, if you're unsure of God's voice, then yeah, pray about it first. Fast some as you're praying. Go get counsel. Ask your friends. Ask your pastor. Go find other mature believers. Ask them. Make the tea chart, the pros and the cons. Follow wisdom until you know the voice you're hearing is God's. But if you've been in that habit of pursuing God's presence, you will recognize his voice. Jesus said it clearly, my sheep know my voice. When I talk, they know it's me. So when that still small voice, like Elijah heard last week on the mountain, when that comes whispering to your heart and asks you to follow, maybe in a different kind of way, You can do it immediately without understanding the details because 
you recognize the voice. Now, here's a quick leadership thought for some of you out there that are leaders, whether it's in a business, at work, or you're in a ministry, or maybe you're leading your home. This fits. You can adapt it. Craig Rochelle is a pastor of one of the largest churches in America, quarterbacking a very large organization. His team is doing a great job at blessing the kingdom and taking people out of the world. It's awesome. But he says that people ask him all the time, because he leads this large organization, they ask him, what's your five-year plan for the church? What's your five-year, you know, that's like the holy grail of business, the five-year plan, the perfect, you know. That's the icebreaker question whenever business people get together. What's your five-year plan? What's your five-year plan, right? What's your five-year plan for the church? And he said his answer to that question has changed a lot over the years. He used to do a five-year plan, but the world has started to change so rapidly, he said, there is no possible way to project five years ahead and anticipate all the divine opportunities along the way. You can't do it. So he learned, and now he doesn't plan anything farther out than 18 months. So instead of planning details for the future, he says what he does is he plans how to be able to respond immediately in the present. He says, I want to be able to respond immediately to the voice of God, to opportunities that I'm not smart enough to predict are coming. He says, therefore, as a staff, we always want to have a financial margin in place. We're not spending the whole budget. We keep a margin in place to seize opportunities we didn't plan for. I want to have margin in our leadership and margin in our time, margin in our families so that we can jump on divine opportunities that we're not smart enough to predict. I think that advice is incredibly wise. Whether you're running a church or a business or a home or whatever, you know, 2020 proved the value of this thought process. And the thing is, this kind of approach, I think, takes more faith while at the same time being easier for all of us to do. We want to position ourselves to obey immediately when the Holy Spirit speaks. So the long-range planning that we can do is how do we set ourselves up in our finances, in our leadership team, in our marriage, with our children, in our training, to give ourselves margin to handle the unexpected so that we're ready all the time to take advantage of opportunities that God brings my way today that I did not see coming. I want to be prepared. Now, to that end, for instance, we've opened the building here on Tuesday evening, 7 o'clock, just to be in his presence and pray. It's not lightning and thunder. I don't plan a program for any of you. I don't even always put, like, things up there for you to pray for, okay? We're just coming in to pray, be in God's presence, read the Bible, uh, you know, just kind of go there as the Holy Spirit leads. It's a small thing. But that time can tune our hearts to hear his voice, Praying for the issues in front of us keeps our mind ready to process his direction when it does come. It keeps us listening, keeps us ready to recognize his voice. Now, more than just a Tuesday night, I encourage all of us to take time personally every day if you can, even if it's only a little bit, a couple minutes, to give God direct and focused attention of some kind so that we'll know his voice when he speaks. Now, Elisha's story is so perfect for us because it represents real life. It really does. He's an ordinary person like us, living an ordinary life, going through a daily grind, hearing from God in a way that God usually leads, without details. Just like Elisha, God is going to speak to you while you're going through your normal routine. You're getting groceries at Kroger. You're driving the kids around town. You're mowing the lawn. You're sitting at your desk at work. You're driving a delivery truck. Whatever it is you do, God is going to speak to you there, and he will not give you all the details up front. I'm just going to let you know. He's not. In fact, I can tell you God is intentionally vague in his instructions for us. It's on purpose. And it's not going to change. So if you are worried that you're not hearing him well enough because you're a bad Christian, that might be it, but it's probably not it, okay? He's, (laughs) sorry, he's purposefully keeping some of the details back because he wants you to lean in. I think there are three good reasons for why God keeps his voice quiet. A, because he knows many times the details would overwhelm you. So he doesn't get you started down that far. I mean, you just, you, you'd quit before you started. 
He wants to handle a lot of it anyway, so he just doesn't tell you. B, if we knew the end goal God was really going for, we'd probably end up trying to get there on our own, and we'd ruin everything, right? I think we've all done that one or a hundred times. Okay, God wants us to be a together project. And C, because this is a together thing, he wants you to keep listening for the next step, the next task, the next page of the instruction booklet. He wants to keep you close, so he'll only give you so much to go on when he speaks. So you're just going to have to get used to trusting him. That's going to be life. Uh, a, a really mature believer I know that does a lot with spiritual gifts and things, he says, the closer I get to God and the more I work in ministry, the quieter God actually gets. I kept thinking that it would get more clear and easy for me to hear him speak and lead me into things, but it turns out he actually gets even quieter the closer I get to him. Because he wants to keep me leaning, you know, just uncomfortable enough that I have to lean to hear what he's trying to say. About a thousand years before Elijah and Elisha got this direction from God, God told Abraham to go. Do you remember that story? He said, leave your people, take your family, and go. No instructions on where, when, how long, how far, anything else. Just go, and I'll let you know when to stop. You know, God initially told Moses Go to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. No instructions on how to organize a million slaves for a journey. No logistics about food or transportation for the handicapped and the elderly. No initial setup for how a government's going to work. God just says, you go get them started. I'll let you know more when you need it. Sometimes all you may get is one word. Peter, remember, sees Jesus walking on the water. He and the disciples in a boat in a storm. He sees Jesus coming out. And he says, wow, that's awesome. Hey, can I come too? You know, and they, they figured out it was Jesus. And Jesus simply says, come. No details, no instructions about, you know, when the waves get bigger, you're going to lean a little to your right. No flotation devices under your seat. No, hey, watch out for this lake trout or this slick spot over here. No, it's just come. And the implication is he's going to handle all the details and then fill you in when it becomes pertinent. Maybe you're struggling with work right now, and you really just want to quit. You're tired of it. It's this grind. I can't handle it. But when you pray about it, you just hear the word, stay. No reasons why yet. No instructions about how much longer. Just stay. And trust me to bring good into your life. Maybe you've been great lately. Work is good. But for some reason, you've had this nudge in your spirit that says, go. Well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, there is an opportunity in this direction, but it doesn't look as safe or as secure as where you are now. But every time you pray, you keep hearing that, go. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks right now and you're thinking about cashing it in, but if you're honest with yourself, you've been praying about it and you've been hearing one word that says, stay. And you don't have to completely understand to obey immediately. If you recognize that voice, you stay. You might have a health situation, doesn't look good. Maybe it's a loved one, and God gives you one word, trust. So you hang on to that word, and you don't know what trust means, but okay, I'm going to trust. Maybe it's an idea for a business or for a ministry, or a book you want to write. You don't know any details, and you're wondering how, when is this going to happen? How are we going to pay for it? I don't understand. It's okay, you don't have to. Get used to disappointment. I've mentioned before that I used to work in an auto body shop before I came here, about five, six years. And at the beginning, it was under a new owner. And he's trying to get things moving, but just business was not coming through. Hit a point where it's four weeks without a paycheck. And I was starting to ask God, do I need to get out? I've got a wife to provide for. I've got rent to make. What do I do? A coworker was telling me, you know, I think you've gotten good enough. You probably could get a job at any shop in Columbus. And so that's starting to sound tempting. Do I do that? But I prayed about it because I'm in the ministry, and you, you kind of have to if you're in the ministry. You don't get to skip that part. So I prayed about it, and all I heard from God was, stay. Well, being the great man of faith that I am, I responded, are you sure? <laughs> really? Let, well, let me keep praying just to make sure I'm hearing you right, God. You know, so I kept praying, and day after day, God would say, stay. And finally, after like a week, he was gracious enough to give me a little more to go on. He said, you stay here, kind of with that tone, you know, like, you stay here, you know, stop asking, and support your boss, and I will provide for you. 
He told me, your paychecks always come from me anyways. This will just be good for your perspective. And I was like, okay, you know. Still, there were no details. He didn't say how long this was going to go or how he'd take care of us in the meantime. But I stayed, and I really didn't talk about it with other people. I knew at that point I'd recognize the voice. And once you admit that you've recognized the voice, you kind of have to. You know, you just, you just do. So fast forward seven weeks now without a paycheck. Finally got to a place where I was starting to sweat about rent coming up. Uh, but I knew I was following God at this point. I recognized the voice. He'd made a promise, so I'm, I'm sticking it out. Well, sure enough, right at that super uncomfortable spot, uh, between a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night at my church, a couple different people walked up to me without me saying a word, slipped money into my hand, and all together was just a bit over the exact amount Barbie and I needed to pay every bill, keep gas in the car, stay fed, keep groceries, all of that, okay? And I think it was another two weeks after that my boss was able to start paying me again. Within a few months, he had made up all the checks that he'd missed, and in the meantime, Barbie and I didn't miss a payment or come in late for anything. When God says it and you recognize the voice, you got to do it. Now, some of you have recently heard a word like that from God. Or maybe you're about to, okay? Which is really scary. I know, I just said that. You're like, oh, great. It wasn't going to happen. But now Nathaniel said it and it's going to happen. So, awesome. But I think some of you are going to be just ridiculous enough to say, okay, I don't know all the details, but I don't have to have them right now to take this first step that I can see. Here's the second principle we see from Elisha. Those God uses the most are the ones that hold on to the least. Watch what Elisha does in verse 21. It says, so he turned back from following Elijah, and he took the team of oxen. This was his livelihood, remember? This is his routine, something we can also call his safe place, his security blanket. His fallback plan. What does he do with them? He slaughters the oxen. What does he do with the plow? He starts a fire and he uses it to cook the oxen to feed the other people that were working with him out in the fields. Now, sacrificing the oxen was one thing. That wasn't so uncommon in his day. But burning the plow. Elisha could have found a tree to chop down. Or gone and gotten wood out from the neighboring field or something. Why burn a farmer's most important piece of equipment? What's he thinking? I think Elisha is making a public gesture that says, I'm burning plan B. I'm burning plan B. He didn't sneak away in the night, leaving the back gate open so that he could sneak back in if God's idea didn't work out so good, you know? No, once he knew he'd heard God's voice, he burned his bridge, threw his own going away party for everybody out there. He made this public, said, God is calling me to go follow this prophet. So what am I doing now? I'm killing the cow and I'm burning the plow. That is ridiculous commitment. But once you've heard God speak, obeying him cannot be plan A. It's got to be the only plan. Ridiculous commitment means no turning back, no wavering. Remember Elijah's call to everyone on the mountain a couple weeks ago? said, no hesitating between two opinions anymore. Stop it. Stop wavering. Just obey. Those God uses the most are the ones that hold on to the least. On April 21st, 1519, the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortez sailed into the harbor of Veracruz, Mexico brought with him 600 men. It may sound like a lot, it wasn't, okay? Now it's true, his men were certainly better armed than the Aztecs, but two prior expeditions of similarly armed soldiers had come from Spain and failed to establish even a single colony on Mexican soil. Nevertheless, over the next two years, Cortez and his 600 were able to defeat Montezuma and all the warriors of the Aztec Empire, making Cortez the conqueror of all Mexico. How in the world did he accomplish this with only 600 men when two whole expeditions had failed miserably? See, Cortez knew that he and his men would face huge odds. He knew at some point his men would want to pack it in and go back to Spain. So the moment Cortez and his men were ashore and unloaded their provisions, he ordered their entire fleet of 11 ships burned. Okay? Thanks, chief. 
His men stood on the shore and watched as the only possibility of retreat burned and sank in the harbor. From that point on, they knew there was no return, no wavering, no second thoughts, no turning back. The only option was to go forward, conquer or die. Now, I am not championing the practice of burning and looting other people's homes. (laughs) Don't go home saying I taught that God favors an imperialistic foreign policy. That's not the point of this. But Cortez's story, as despicable as his motivations may have been or his ignorance may have been, it does illustrate the power of a no plan B approach. And if we, like Elisha, are willing to respond to God's voice in this manner, our ordinary lives will see some pretty amazing things because we're following an amazing God and it comes natural for him. We we just get caught up in it. Now, when people come to my office for advice, typically I probably am going to say, do hang on to the cows and the plows, okay? Don't burn them. (laughs) It's a wise thing, you know, and, and scripture speaks very highly of acting in wisdom. However, when you know you recognize the voice, the wise thing is now to do whatever it is he's asking you to do. Okay, that becomes the wise thing. His voice is the trump card in the game of wisdom. So time after time after time in scripture, we see God speak to people and then they commit and they do stupid stuff because they recognize the voice and it works. The first time Peter met Jesus in Luke 5, Peter is at the end of a bad night of fishing. You might remember the story. It's in the chosen. You'll get to this if you go to that small group. Peter's tired. Caught nothing but seaweed all night. He's cleaning up to go home. Jesus walks up and says, hey, dude, I know you're tired. I know you're ready to go home. I can see it. You don't know me from Adam, but go out in deep water again. Put your nets out. Peter's thinking, okay, I'm the fisherman. You look like maybe a carpenter. So should I explain to you how fishing works? But something in Jesus' eye or his tone must have cut through to Peter's heart. Peter says, Okay, Peter goes back out. He catches so many fish, he needed help to get them in without sinking his own boat. It was such a miracle that he knew there was something of the presence of God in this moment about Jesus. So when he gets back, he falls at Jesus' feet. He says, go away from me, Lord, because I know I'm a sinful person, and I shouldn't have the honor of being in God's presence. Jesus says, well, no, actually, I meant you're supposed to come with me. (laughs) Come with me. From now on, you're going to catch people instead of fish. Again, Peter recognized the voice in the moment. So he and his fellow partners, they brought the boats to land. They left everything and followed Jesus. You know, they just caught the catch of a lifetime. This was a huge load. They were going to be rich for a while. but, But they left it all to follow Jesus because he had said, come. Now, we read about Elisha, we read about Peter, James, and John, we read about others in Scripture, but I think maybe we never even think about applying this to our own situations. Leave my job? Are you crazy? I mean, you know, this is what I do, right? I've been trained, this, I got my degree in this, right? Leave my comfortable home, my, my possessions, my quiet neighbor? I don't think so. <laughs> you send me letters, let me know how it's going, I'll write you a check. Was that a little too on the nose? Again, God doesn't call everyone in the same way to do the same thing. So I'm not saying God's asking you to to sell your house and, and move to California or Korea or wherever, okay? But for some of you, I think God is going to speak to you at some point and give you a plow burning faith. Now you make sure it's God's voice. Don't just go in tomorrow and say, I'm sick of this job, I can't stand this, I hate you all, and then burn the office down. Okay, don't do that. That is not plow-burning faith. That's called being an irresponsible idiot, and we do not teach that at this church. But once you know that God is asking you to do something, he's told you to go, and you know that you can't keep your life that you're currently living in the same shape and do what God is asking, at that point, ridiculous commitment will be You burning the plow, burning the ships, burning whatever it is because you're not turning back. Something has happened. You, an ordinary person, have heard from an extraordinary God and you're saying, okay, I trust you. I'm going to go. Now, maybe it isn't a job thing. 
I know a guy was done with pornography. He, it was over for him. So he, he finally was willing to spend money on a monitoring software that would email people if it saw you going to a site that you th it thought was suspect. So he, he put in his wife's email address. He, he's making sure, I'm going to be clean of this. I don't want this messing with my life anymore. And that worked on his computer for a while, but then he got a smartphone. And at that time, smartphones didn't have quite the same security controls they have now. So he started finding ways around his guardrails, began to hurt his faith again, his relationship with God. He would doubt God. He would doubt himself. And it's really getting to him. So the only thing he could think of to do was get rid of the phone. So he takes a hammer and he smashed his iPhone. It's a thousand dollar iPhone, okay? He said, I'm burning the plow. It's not going to take me down even one more time. Still uses a flip phone. Hates it. <laughs> but he loves the freedom in his mind and the sense of innocence and trust he again has in his relationship with God. Pastor was talking about a, a family from his church they were pretty strong, grounded Christians, but pretty much every summer, they would go off to their lake house every weekend and basically disappear from church for the season. And then one day, their nine-year-old daughter asked her dad, she says, Daddy, why is it we love God like all year long, but we don't love God in the summer? <laughs> yeah, I know. Kids have a way, right? So when dad heard that, he and his wife start thinking and they realize we are putting God on hold every summer. They didn't worship in the summer. They didn't serve anybody in the summer. They didn't make a difference in the summer. It had all become about their own enjoyment. So realizing that, the family, de the family decides, we're going to burn the plow. They sold the boat. They sold the lake house. Now, having a boat even and a lake house is not wrong in itself. It wouldn't necessarily be the right move for everybody. It was for them. Okay? It was them. It was the right thing for them to do. They said, we are not going to set the example for our kids that God is only important for part of the year. I'd like the worship team to come up. We're going to have a closing moment of worship and prayer and, and uh, just kind of get personal with God. Would you stand with me as well? As we get ready to pray today, I, I want to ask you a couple questions. So let's go ahead and bow our, bow our heads, close our eyes. And, and let the Holy Spirit just get close and, and tinker in our hearts just a little bit. Maybe many of you are going through your routine and it's boring and Elijah has not come by and thrown a, a coat over you yet. God has not approached you yet with something out of the ordinary that he wants you to do and you're feeling stuck and it's, it's a dredge and you just, ugh. So maybe your statement of faith and trust right now is to stay at the plow because he hasn't yet called you into something new. You need to maintain that discipline and the responsibility and keep plugging away at the day-to-day. -day and you're saying, I really need strength to do this. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Because I just, I just want to be able to pray for you today, if that's where you're at. Thank you. Maybe for others of you, God's bringing something to mind right now or has been that he's been prodding you about, a go or a stay or something, and, and you need to burn a plow. There's something keeping you from serving God in a certain way. There's a, a sin habit poisoning your relationship with God, and you need to burn that plow. There's a, a spirit of fear or maybe unforgiveness choking your life right now, and, and you need to take steps to burn that plow. There's an unhealthy relationship dragging you down. You've got to burn the plow. There's a security blanket you've been hanging on to, a plan B, just in case God's plan doesn't work out, and you know you need to burn that plow. I want to pray for you today, if that's you. And, and if you'll recognize the, his voice speaking to you and you want to have the ridiculous commitment to say yes, if that's you, would you raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Thank you. Thank you, God, for giving us that kind of faith. And as we keep praying, I think there are others of us in this room maybe that would recognize you don't have that kind of faith, and that's okay. This is not a church where you need to pretend and you might even say, I can't really say I'm actually a follower of Jesus. I just kind of showed up here or I, I turned my computer on and decided to check it out. And, and there might be a lot of reasons and circumstances and feelings behind where you are right now with God or without God. But if today you've been feeling drawn a bit toward God, even if you feel you have a million reasons not to be, you know, you're not good enough, you're mad at God for some things or, or something that's happened, you're not even sure you believe is real, but if that's you and you're still feeling drawn, I'm not going to ask you to make a commitment right now, but I would ask you to raise your hand and tell me you're open to letting God speak to you a little more.
you're open to continuing the conversation. Is that anybody here? Thank you. All I'm going to do is ask for God to keep speaking to you and showing himself to you. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for these people who are taking steps into conversation with you. They want to hear your voice better. They want to recognize you quicker. They don't know yet if they're going to have the faith to say yes when you bring an ask before them, but they want it. They want to have that kind of faith. So I ask that you continue drawing their hearts, continue speaking to them and letting them know how much you love them and you care about them and and you want them to make the choice to trust you and follow you, to surrender to your care and your powerful protection because there's no one like you. Lord, I thank you for those of us needing to trust you in our routines or maybe trust you as you're asking us to step out of our comfort zones. Help us to hear your voice clearly and to follow with decisiveness, even ridiculous commitment because you're worth it, Jesus. You are faithful. You are trustworthy all the time, every time. So we trust that your plan is better. In Jesus' name, then we're going to sing a song. And, and while I do, I invite you to take this moment to put a prayer like that into your own words. So whether you sing with us or not, I don't really care. What I'd like is for you to have a moment in your heart with the Holy Spirit to just let him walk you through wherever he wants you in your life. Sing wherever you may be, I will follow. Jesus speak wherever you may lead I will follow Holy Spirit come wherever you may lead I will follow wherever
Lord, we want to hear your voice more clearly, more readily, wherever we're at during the day, whether it's in a time of studying your word or praying or we're at work or school or just going about our routine. Lord, don't let us miss your voice. Don't let us miss your voice. We want to be close to you, God, in every way that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have a prayer team over here to your left. If there's anything at all you would like prayer for, they would love to bring that into God's presence with you. The rest of you go be safe this weekend. Have a wonderful time in his presence. Follow him. Listen for his voice. Amen.